Hey guys, my name is Shannon. Welcome back to my code review series where we look at suspicious projects that you guys send me. We're back at it again with the 2000 hour 2D game engine because you guys said you would love for me to keep looking at this project and considering we didn't get past the GitHub readme last time. Uh, yeah, I agree. We should probably keep looking at this. By the way, if you didn't catch the last video where we started looking at this project, I'll have it linked up there. The goal today is going to be to actually look at some code. So here we have the project. I've cloned it. I've even built it. It's ready to go. Let's have a look at the project structure to begin with. So we have engine and GitHub. GitHub just has this uh, this diagram that we looked at last time. And then engine is where everything is. So this person mentioned in the email that it's just a Visual Studio solution and project. No need to generate anything, you just run this. That's not a good way to organize the build system for your project in general. I have written down in my list of videos to make to make a video talking about why that is. So I'm not gonna spend too much time explaining it today. Generally, what you want to do is use a build system such as CMake or Premake. I personally highly recommend Premake. I much prefer it to CMake. And it's certainly a lot easier to get started if you're looking at a project like this. Although actually you might have some issues with dependencies if they provide CMake build files and not remake build files. But anyway, build systems are important even if you are just on a single platform like Windows. The major reason why is because when you use a build system to generate your project files, you are always going to be generating the project files that are specific to your system. Now that doesn't mean that it's gonna be all absolute paths like CMake likes to do, one of the reasons why I don't like it. But what I'm more talking about is like what version of Visual Studio are you using? What version of the compiler are you using? What version of the Windows SDK are you using? How are your dependencies and environment variables set up? What kind of potential variant of that project are you trying to generate? There's all these variables that go into how do I want to build this thing? And when you use just Visual Studio solution project files, whilst that can be a really easy, fast way to get started, the flexibility and configurability is greatly reduced. Not to mention that you can only obviously use Visual Studio with this project. So that is my first piece of advice. Now, diving more into this project structure, we have a library directory, which has a bunch of lib files, debug, release. Uh, debug just has PDBs, interestingly enough. Uh, and then release has nothing. Okay, so you're using SFML. Uh, I think that was in the readme as well, wasn't it? And then Vorbis, I guess, for audio, free type, flag, sure. This is probably all part of SFML, isn't it? I don't know why the debug, like, are these debug libraries? Yeah, okay, so the debug libraries are here as well. So you can see that one common convention with library files is that you'll see like a D at the end of some libraries, and that just indicates that this is the debug variant. You can also compare, just as a little side note, the file sizes. So you can see that the debug is like seven and a half meg, and then the 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 one without the D, which is presumably the release library, is a lot smaller. And that's because debug obviously contains a lot more information so that you can debug better. And this kind of follows the same pattern. So my suspicion is like, uh, I'm not sure why the PDBs are here. I don't even know if this will work properly because what the PDBs are, by the way, is it stands for program database. And it's basically a database of a whole bunch of information that maps symbols to actual specific source code, which is obviously very, very, very useful when you're debugging. This is basically how when you're using a debugger, it knows that the current instruction that it's executing is specifically this line of C++ code that you've written. Without these files, it's not gonna know that because obviously that original source code goes through a lot of transformation when it gets built into like machine code that your CPU will actually be executing. And whilst your actual binaries might still contain named symbols because if you haven't stripped any kind of debug information or any kind of symbols from your binaries you may still find the actual function names there it's still going to be difficult to equate all of the essentially assembly instructions but assembly instructions would be the disassembled machine code because your CPU is obviously executing the machine code and not the assembly but nevertheless this way it lets you equate that machine code slash assembly to actual C++ source code which is very very useful so I don't know if these being in this directory I don't know how this happened uh, because it doesn't look like I don't think you're compiling SFML, but that's just something I noticed, something interesting. Resources, things to add to user. Works in it, yes. Rotation, yes. Change name. Okay, sure. It's probably some development file. It's like a, a to-do or something. Saves, icons, font. Okay, sure. So we've got a bunch of fonts. We've got template. Oh, okay, templates. So this is possibly perhaps when you make a new project, it copies that directory or something. Then we have source directory. Okay, so let's move on to Visual Studio. I've already got it open in Visual Studio here and we'll take a look at it through here. So sprite engine.cpp, let's give it a run first and we'll see what this project is. But first, if you want an excellent free way to ease into computer science and learn a whole bunch of math while you're at it, then check out brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. They have a bunch of fun, easy to follow computer science courses that can really help you if you're having trouble wrapping 
wrapping your head around what it means to actually write code and think like a programmer. And in these courses, you'll be learning this stuff in a really, really visual, interactive and engaging way. You won't just be watching videos. You'll be asked to actually click on stuff, manipulate it to see how things work. And you'll be constantly quizzed to make sure that you're actually learning and retaining the information that's being taught to you. Math is also super important for programming and Brilliant have this wonderful everyday math course that will ease you into math if you've never really done it before or you've never found it easy. And their math courses will follow through all the way to advanced topics such as calculus. And again, in that fun, interactive and engaging way. And the best thing about Brilliant is you can get started for free. They have a 30 day free trial that you can use to check out all of the courses on their platform and see if you like them. And if you do, Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 subscribers 20% off an annual membership. Huge thank you to Brilliant as always for sponsoring this video. Okay. <laughs> so we, this is the source code. Yes, we have made it. We are finally looking at actual code in a code review video. But <laughs> if I may, there's already problems when I look over here. There is a single project in this entire solution. In this entire game engine, there is a single project. That is not what I would do. I'm hesitant to say that that is wrong. Uh, like I don't like using the words right and wrong because I feel like programming is so subjective and like to me, honestly, programming is a bit of an art form. And so if you're an artist and you come in and you do things, yes, they might not be conventional. Yes, they might not be how everyone else would do it. And yes, they might not be how professional engineers would architect game engines, but that might not be the goal here. The goal might be, well, I want to do this the way I want to do this. You can't look at someone's painting and be like, no, 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 that is wrong. Like, yeah, sure. They might be able to use better techniques to achieve better transfer of the ideas and the image they have in their mind into this actual physical medium, but they could always turn around and be like, no, but this is what I'm going for and I am achieving it, thank you very much. And so I guess my point is my advice here is not necessarily this is right, this is wrong and I am the judge that decides it all. It's more so, is this something the Cherno would do or is this not something the Cherno would do? And this is not something the Cherno would do. Why? Because you are blurring the line between game and engine. And the reason why that is not a good thing to do is because game does not equal engine, does not equal engine. And it's also, my diagram just uh, got deleted. So game does not equal engine. And it's also the fact that the relationship between these two is kind of like, well, you, the engine is gonna be capable of making more than one game. You're gonna have multiple games. And then this engine is supposed to be like the central core platform that these games are using. And so if you just have the single project, it's like, okay, well, how do I make a game? Now that is just the beginning. And if we look at how this is actually used. So the main function of this engine immediately opens a UI project select and we open up a project. And then we, it looks like we start some kind of instance of the engine, we create like a render window and then we update the engine. This doesn't make any sense because a game engine is actually two different applications, which again is why this single project here is just, just makes no sense. A game engine, at least this, like what I can see from this code, your game engine, the way you've decided to make a game engine is it has to be two completely different applications. There has to be the editor, which is this, like, I would like to open a project, please. This is clearly part of the editor, and so is all of this. And then in orange, we have the engine, which is presumably going to actually run stuff. It could run the editor. The editor could be an application that the engine supports. The editor could be written entirely using engine runtime features. That's also totally fine, but nevertheless, it is still a separate application. And then we have this, which is kind of the core engine, or you could call it the runtime. And I see this sort of design all the time. And this is unfortunately what tends to happen when someone doesn't understand the full picture of what it means to build a game engine, which extends to them simply just not having the experience to know all of the moving parts, which I don't blame them because it's it can be quite complicated to understand what a game engine is, but this is a huge fundamental issue that I wanna try and clear up here. To everyone making a game engine out there, you have to consider the most important case of how your engine is going to be used. Now, if you are just making a little application game engine, you just wanna see how they work, you just wanna play around with it, then maybe I could see how this approach could be okay. But traditionally, a game engine is made, why? Because we would like to make a game with it, or maybe an interactive application of some sort. So then if you are making a game engine, and the goal with the game engine is to produce a game that you will then distribute and ship out to people who will play the game, that 
<laughs> that conglomerate of people is your primary user base. Not the people using the editor, not the people using the game engine to make the game, it's gonna be the players of the game. So that is step one, really, and that should be at the back of your mind, and probably at the front of your mind, the entire time that you're building a game engine. It's what is the experience like for someone who plays this game. And so obviously, if we just look at this main function here, the player of the game is not gonna be presented with a UI project selector to be like, oh yeah, I wanna load this project. No, that's what the editor is for. That's what the development team uses. And furthermore, not when they're playing the game or testing the game, but when they're actually opening the editor in order to build or develop the game. Now, this is the only solution file that is in this project, because as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, well, maybe this is specifically the editor. But see, the thing is that still doesn't make sense because even if this solution was the editor and Sprite Engine is, that's the editor part of it, it's in a single project, which is again, why this project situation doesn't make sense because that core engine is gonna lend itself to the game which you ship, and also all of the development tools, such as the editor, because obviously the editor needs to be able to use the engine in order to, you know, like build your scenes and run them and do all of that stuff. That is generally how game engines work these days. It's the what you see is what you get, WYSIWYG form of editing. And that involves you having like a viewport inside your editor that is using the engine's core and the engine's runtime to present an image that is a perfect reflection of what the final product will be like. Now that wasn't always the case. In fact, even in 2015, 2016, when I worked at EA on the mobile engine team, developing an engine called Osiris, which would be used to ship many, many games. But in 2015, we were focusing our efforts on supporting the game team that would ship Need for Speed No Limits. The editor for Osiris and the editor for, well, that game that they used was a completely standalone application that in fact did not use the core. I mean, from memory, like it may have used bits of it, but what you saw in the viewport, I don't know if I have any screenshots saved anyway, I don't know if I'd be allowed to share them anyway, but the rendering of like the racetrack that you were editing would be completely fabricated. Like it had no lighting, it was just models around. And one of my biggest projects that year was actually to load in light maps so that the team could not see a flatly lit version of the track, especially because a lot of this game took place at night, but we would kind of stream in those light map textures as they were being generated by a third party light map generator. So yes, it, I mean, that that isn't even that long ago, but there the editor is a completely standalone application. It simply edits data files that are that level. And then the core engine, the runtime, when you load the game and you play it, it loads those files from disk that have been produced by a completely separate editor application. And that's how you actually see it for the first time in game, how it would look to the player. That's obviously a very slow system for iterating. It's much better to just look at exactly, you know, what you see is what you get to look at the final finished product, tweak the lighting however you want, tweak everything however you want, hit play, you're instantly playing it inside that editor application. That's the dream. And so that's strongly like what I would be doing here. And the core takeaway from this that would enable that to happen is this shared code base that has to be shared between the game that you ship out that is the runtime application of the game and also this editor tooling that uses this engine. Now it doesn't have to use the engine as a platform to make the editor application, if you know what I mean. So in this case, you might be picturing the editor as really just being a game. Uh, it's just that it happens to be a game with lots of UI that can, you know, is used to edit and actually make games. That's certainly viable. That's something you could do, but this editor could be made with an entirely different you know, UI platform or something. Like for example, it could even use C Sharp WPF, which would kind of restrict it to being Windows only. It could use Qt or Qt. It could use I am GUI, which is maybe something that you wouldn't have in either the core engine or like in the game that you ship at all. But even if it's written in C Sharp and it's in a completely different language, it can still use that C++ engine to render the images that you see and to you know, process the assets and the game data and do all of that stuff. So that is the fundamental problem with what we are looking at today. And specifically in my opinion and in my experience, a major tell of the inexperience of someone who's writing this. Because the first thing I would expect to see is this is the runtime that plays the game. Not necessarily, yeah, this is the this is the this is the game engine application and it's really just an editor. Okay, now should we try running this in release? 
Okay. Well, there goes the, oh, don't worry, it doesn't have a build system, just open the Visual Studio solution and run it. Does debug work? Okay, debug does actually work. So here's debug. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, we can do open or create. I guess we should try and create. Ugh, this is so annoying. I really dislike it when people make their own file dialogs. I think you should always use the native file dialog for whatever platform you're using. So if you're using Windows, you know, just use this. Because you know why? Because you have all of your, like, saved pins here. You have all of your drives here. I can click here and I can paste in parts. I can just paste in a full path of a file here and hit open. I'm used to this conventional design. Why implement something worse where I have to <laughs> navigate from my root drive, which I can't even collapse by the way. And also I can only see the C drive. What the heck? Where are all of my other drives? All right, this is enough for one video. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this uh, code review. We didn't really get past the first file, but we did run the project. I'm looking forward to trying to make a new project with this, seeing like what the editor and the actual game engine can do. Cause again, 2000 hours, I have high hopes for this. If you would like to see more, definitely let me know in the comment section below and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to check out Brilliant, link will be in the description below. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.